Welcome to the Influenza webinar series hosted by the Human Vaccines Project. The Human Vaccines Project is a nonprofit public private partnership with the goal of decoding the human immune system to accelerate the development of vaccines and immunotherapies. In order to make real progress towards the development of a universal influenza vaccine, collaboration among researchers around the world is essential. We hope this monthly webinar will foster the scientific foundation needed to advance influenza research. This series of webinars will be broadcast on the third Tuesday of each month and posted online. For a copy of today's webinar, please visit the Human Vaccines Project website at www.humanvaccinesproject.org backslash talks. Following the presentation, we will have time for questions from the audience. Please type your questions into the questions box in the GoTo interface. I will read these questions following the presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to call your attention to an upcoming symposium on innovative vaccines for resistant infectious diseases and emergent threats being hosted by the New York Academy of Sciences on May 22nd in New York. The symposium will include talks from some of the world's leaders in vaccine development, including Wayne Koff, CEO of the Human Vaccines Project. Please note the early word deadline for registration is April 19th. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Seema Lakdawala. Dr. Lakdawala is a microbiologist who synthesizes biochemistry, microscopy, and animal models in her study of influenza virus assembly and pathogenesis. She is currently an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh, where she runs her own lab. Dr. Lakdawala and her team studies the assembly of influenza, genomic RNA, and the viral and environmental properties which promote airborne influenza transmission with the goal of developing comprehensive surveillance system to assess the pandemic potential of influenza strains. Today, Dr. Lakdawala will tell us about seeing is believing from intracellular influenza viral RNA assembly to persistence of influenza viruses and aerosols. Go ahead, Seema. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the in invitation um, to tell you all a little bit about my work uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. And so hopefully uh, all of the movies play. I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience um, about influenza viruses, but I just want to give everybody sort of a basic introduction. Uh, this is a cross section of an influenza virus, right? It's an envelope virus. There are two surface glycoproteins. Uh, I'm sure many of the webinars in the past have covered this. Um, the first glycoprotein is the hemagglutinin or HA. And there are currently 18 subtypes of the HA uh, protein and it binds to cell surface receptors. The other glycoprotein is the NA. Um, it destroys sialic acids to minimize aggregation and there are 11 known subtypes. Um, I'm sure everyone knows, but when we talk about influenza viruses like H1N1, we're talking about a hemagglutinin of subtype 1 with a neuraminidase of subtype 1. So you can appreciate the large variation uh, that exists um, in nature between 18 subtypes of HA and 11 subtypes of NA. The genome, which is what my lab is really concerned with um, and has studied for quite some time now, is composed of negative sense RNA segments. So there are eight negative sense RNA segments um, that make up the influenza A virus uh, genomic material. And each segment is sort of shown schematically here where the RNA coats these uh, gray uh, spheres, which are the nuclear protein. And the three prime and five prime ends are bound by the polymerase, the virally encoded polymerase complex. Um, what's necessary for a fully infectious virus is that you need one copy of all eight segments um, because they encode the 11, 11 plus proteins that make up uh, the viral machinery to overtake a cell um, and produce more influenza viruses once it's inside of a cell. And so this incorporation of all eight uh, segments into one single virion is sort of an interesting concept that I'm going to talk about today of how do you get one copy of all eight um, and how is that sort of mechanism ensured and, and what kind of things are we studying in my lab to tease us apart. Uh, so there have been four pandemics in our last century. Uh, my lab is really interested in sort of the emergence of pandemics and the part of flu assembly that uh, is important for these prop properties. Um, so going back 100 years, 1918, uh, there was obviously the H1N1 Spanish flu that circulated in human population until 1957, where there was an H2N2 outbreak until 1968. And there was an emergence of an H3N2 strain in 1968, so referred to as Hong Kong flu. Um, and then in 1977, there was re-emergence of the 1957 H1N1 strain that circulated in the human population until 2009. Um, 
where there was this wine flu 2009 pandemic. And so, you know, my lab is interested in how pandemic viruses emerge. And so many of these pandemics emerge through a process known as reassortment. Um, and so what is reassortment? Well, there's two viruses. And because the genomes of influenza viruses are segmented, and I said that you need all eight segments to make a fully infectious virus, what happens is when two different strains of flu infect the same cell, the genomic segments can swap and you can get a variety of different types of viruses that emerge from a single co-infected cell um, that is in, uh, where the genomic materials have sort of intermingled. This process of reassortment uh, has produced uh, most of the known influenza pandemics, the 1957, 1968, and 2009 pandemic. It also is responsible for a lot of the genetic diversity that we see in nature for influenza strains. Um, and it's, there is a bottleneck um, so experimentally, if you do a co-infection experiment in vivo or in vitro, so either in animals or in cells, um, you will not get at all 256 possible combinations if you use two influenza strains. And what drives this bottleneck um, is really an interesting phenomenon that we're interested, that my lab is looking at in terms of looking at constraints at the genetic um, segment level, looking at how different segments assemble uh, into a virus and whether that is leading to this reassortment bottleneck. So as I mentioned, my lab is interested in the sort of larger question of how pandemic influenza viruses emerge. And the way I think about this and the way we've been thinking about it for the past few years is that it's like a racetrack. At the starting line, there are all these influenza viruses that are found um, in animal species. So flu is not only a human pathogen, it's also an animal pathogen, which is why it always poses such a um, large pandemic risk and a huge pen, uh, public health burden. In these animal species, such as uh, chicken or waterfowl or pig species, uh, the virus is constantly reassorting, right? This process of co-infection and intermingling of the segments. And these newly emerging viruses have to overcome certain hurdles in order to become epidemiologically successful in the human population, because we're ultimately interested in human influenza pandemics. So these viruses have to overcome the first hurdle, which is they have to have the access, they have to be able to infect a human host. Um, and so it's easier for some animal viruses than others to infect a human host. This leads to a smaller pool of viruses, and these viruses have to overcome the second hurdle, which is to replicate efficiently within the human host. Um, do they use the right receptors? Can they internalize? Do they use the right host machinery um, for replication? All of those can sort of limit this bottleneck. And this, uh, only a few viruses can overcome this hurdle. So again, we're narrowing down. Um, and the last hurdle, which is probably one of the biggest hurdles is that they have, these viruses have to be able to transmit between the air, um, between people. And only viruses that can do all three of these tasks uh, could become a pandemic. And so my lab is focused primarily on these last two hurdles here, replication inside of a cell, as well as airborne transmission. Um, and so I'll tell you two stories today, one on replication, which we'll start with, and then one on transmission. And so this is the in, sort of a rough schematic of the influenza viral life cycle. So influenza viruses bind to cell receptors, the salic acids on um, the cell surface of a plasma membrane of a cell, they get internalized. Uh, upon low pH, the HA um, will facilitate fusion of the viral membrane with the endosomal membrane, and it'll release the genomic material into the cytoplasm. Our influenza is an RNA virus unlike other RNA viruses in that it replicates in the nucleus. And so the viral RNA are transported into the nucleus, which is a site of viral RNA synthesis and replication. And these newly synthesized viral RNA species segments have to then transport out of the nucleus um, and assemble into a complex of all eight towards the plasma membrane for budding, right? As influenza buds from the plasma membrane. And so there's a lot of questions we didn't know about this. And one of the things that I've been interested in answering for a long time is how do influenza viral RNA segments sort of assemble inside of a cell? And so I might uh, refer to viral RNA as vRNA, and this is the genomic RNA, so the negative sense, not uh, any of the mRNA or the cRNA, which is the complement uh, replication intermediate. So 
the model um, after I, I worked on this for quite a number of years um, that we proposed um, after using a variety of imaging techniques was that influenza viral RNA segments seem to replicate in the nucleus and form subcomplexes of more than two but less than eight. And these subcomplexes uh, export together and then they hitch a ride on endosomes. And these endosomes undergo dynamic fusion or fission events um, and that helps facilitate a complex of all eight. And we've been, you know, we use this to sort of study viral RNA segments, um, but this opens a lot of questions as to the host proteins that are important for the transport machinery uh, and the transport of viral RNA from the nucleus all the way to the plasma membrane for budding. And so for the past few years, we've been interested in examining some of the host proteins involved in this process. And so we started looking at the um, endosomes. So these are actually rab 11 containing recycling endosomes, um, and also the cytoskeletal proteins that are important for transport. So this just shows um, that viral RNA, so this is um, actually immunofish, so which is immuno, um, immunofluorescence combined with fluorescent in situ hybridization. So here we're looking at the viral RNA segment for PA that encodes for the PA protein. Uh, and here is RAB11A, which is a small GTPase um, that marks recycling endosomes that typically go apically in differentiated airway epithelial cells. Um, and it's previously been shown by other groups that RAB11A can specifically bind to PB2. And again, this is the, the viral RNA um, this is sort of the genomic architecture of influenza. And there are three polymerase components and PB2 is one of the viral polymerase components that is thought to bind to rab 11 uh, I do wanna highlight that, uh, you know, I sort of draw different that there are these regions that are exposed. And so there was work that we published uh, a couple years ago now showing that the viral RNA um, are actually have a different architecture, that there are regions of the RNA that are exposed and that are not bound by nuclear protein. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any questions about that. So we wanted to start looking at RAB11A and, and one of the first questions we wanted to ask was whether um, viral infection could alter the transport dynamics of RAB11A. Does it change the movement of RAB11A if it's hijacking it for its own purposes, then presumably it is. And so in order to actually image um, endosomal movement inside of a cell, because it happens so quickly, we actually utilized a um, sort of emerging, um, not emerging, but sort of novel um, microscopy techniques. And, and we constructed a light sheet microscope that was developed by our collaborators at the National Institute of Biotechnology and Bioengineering at the NIH, um, Hari Schwaff. And it is a light sheet microscope and it's actually a dual view light sheet. To conventional spinning disc confocal microscopes um, is that in the spinning disc confocal, you are illuminating an entire sample, right? So imagine you're trying to image a golf ball. And in a confocal, what you'll do is you have a flashlight and that's your laser source. And you shine this flashlight on this golf ball and you illuminate the entire ball, but you only take a single plane. You only, you only capture light from a single plane um, and it'll look like a circle. And then if you move through the golf ball in three dimensions in a confocal and you reconstruct it, you'll get what looks like an American football, right? It's an oblong because there, just, there is a distortion in the Z plane. So the XY axis, the XY resolution is similar, uh, but it's almost two to three times uh, in the Z direction. And in light sheet microscope, what happens is instead of using a flashlight, we're using a very thin sheet of light. Um, and so we are illuminating a very single plane and that is the exact same plane that we are imaging. And so there isn't a lot of photo damage to the rest of the sample as you capture all of the different planes. Um, and because of this decrease in photo damage, we have a imaging rate that is 30 times faster than a regular spinning disc confocal um, for a similar signal to noise ratio. So the movies I'll be showing you today, if, um, I, don't, if I forget to mention it, then um, we're doing an entire cell volume, which is 50 slices in about 500 milliseconds. 
right? So that's less than a second um, to get an entire cell volume. And so we're doing really high temporal imaging rates. Um, also, a power of the light chain microscope is that because of this dual view, we have um, one view on one side and another view on another side. Um, we can capture, we can go back to isotropic resolution because we can now use, uh, we can fuse and render the images such that we can uh, remove the distortion in the Z axis. Um, and so now we have similar resolution in X, Y, and Z. And so this allows for us to track things with high um, accuracy in, uh, inside of a cell. Okay, so this is uh, the light sheet microscope that we built at the University of Pittsburgh, and this work was done by um, Amar Bhagwat in my lab and Eric Natribi um, helped him, and Amar built the whole system. So here is our pipeline. So these are cells that we have that stably express this GTPase RAB11A, that is GFP tag. These are A549 cells that stably express them. And what we can do is we can have a field of cells and we can isolate a single cell, demarcate the cover slip, um, identify the nucleus and RAB11A. This is typically where there is no um, nuclear, no signal because RAB11A doesn't go into the nucleus. We can then identify spots. Um, and we can track these spots using uh, an imaging software known as Amaris. Um, and this will give us uh, good tracking in X, Y, and Z dimensions. And then we can export all of this position and time data uh, and do even more analysis using custom algorithms that we've developed in MATLAB. And so we can now sort of decipher the movement, uh, the intracellular movement of host proteins, and I will talk about viral RNA as well, um, using this pipeline and giving some quantitation to the movement. And so what do we do to move? Like, how do we analyze this movement? So the first that we look at is track length, which is how long is the track. And so you can see this is sort of a spot and it moves a certain distance. The displacement is actually how far the spot has traveled. Um, and the duration is the amount of time. We can then use these um, values to give us information on the speed as well as the velocity of a track. And so we can use those parameters to tell us, you know, how fast foci are moving and, the, uh, and as well as the velocity of which they are moving. In addition, um, you can see that not all tracks are the same, right? So here are three tracks that we typically see where there is some local movement, some long range movement, and somewhere in between. We also look at a parameter known as straightness, which is how direct is this path? And this is typically from zero to one. And so track one here would have a straightness of about zero. Track two would have a straightness of about one. Uh, and track three would be somewhere in the middle. We also look at a rest coefficient, which is how often do uh, spots sort of have local motion along a track. So they'll do some spots will go local, have long range, and then more local motion. So how often does a spot halt along its track? And we think this is important for um, understanding how uh, viral RNA segments may all come together um, in route to the plasma membrane. So. Within a given cell, so I just told you our pipeline for imaging a single cell, um, we image multiple cells, but within each single cell, there are thousands and thousands of tracks that we can capture and analyze within a five minute movie. Again, we're capturing our entire volumetric imaging rate is uh, about half a second, uh, 700 milliseconds using both arms. Um, and so we have lots of temporal information even in a five minute movie. And so we have thousands and thousands of tracks um, and we wanna analyze all of these tracks, but also compare them with between cells, right? So we understand the cell to cell variability. Uh, and so to do this, instead of comparing histograms um, of different parameters between cells, we also wanna compare these to different conditions. We use something known as the cumulative frequency. So we've taken all of um, the histogram of frequencies of, a, of tracks inside of a cell, we put plot them as a cumulative frequency, and then we take the 50% value of the cumulative frequency so that we can distill all of this information of all of these tracks inside of a cell down to one value that we can then compare between cells of the same treatment group or between different treatment groups. So here uh, is just another movie because uh, it's fun to watch movies. So this again is the GFP tagged RAB11A. Um, and these are uninfected cells, and you can just sort of have an appreciation for the amount of movement that happens sort of apically as well as around the entire cell, and that the majority of the RAB11A tends to be bound to the um, apical surface of the plasma membrane. 
And so um, going through some of these parameters that I talked about, right, looking at duration and track speed and straightness and arrest coefficient, um, what you can see is that influenza infection, so now here we infected with an H1N1 virus, the WSN strain, which is a lab adapted strain. Uh, you can see that influenza infection produces RAB11A um, vesicles that tend to be longer, so the movement is um, now longer, slower, and more arrested in the presence of influenza viral infection. And so how do we think viruses are doing that? I'm not going to go through too much more data, but we have some really interesting data where we think that virus, viral RNA is actually out-competing um, certain motor proteins. And so here, if you imagine, RAB11A is a small GTPase, and it facilitates uh, binding to different motor proteins on an endosome um, by binding to these inner, these, um, what are called FIPS, which are these sort of interacting domain proteins. And so RAB11A will bind to multiple FIPS that either bind to dynein or kinesins that move on microtubules. Um, it can also bind to myosin, which moves on actin. So it has the ability to move along both microtubules as well as actin uh, filaments. Um, and perhaps uh, this uh, for this audience, I should I should mention that you know endosomes don't just move by binding to a single motor, right? They don't move as we walk in a very directional manner. They actually have a, a similar amount. Or they actually have differing amounts of plus end and negative end motors. So dynein and kinesin are found on an endosome, and they tend to do this rock and back motion. Um, and by changing the proportion of motor proteins, you can alter the dynamics um, and the movement of these endosomes. And so what we think is happening, and we have some evidence for this, um, is that the viral RNA segments are out-competing um, certain fit proteins or motor proteins, and that is producing, um, changing the amount of different motors that are on these endosomes. Uh, in particular, we think it's uh, altering the amount of dynein um, that are on these endosomes. Uh, but we really, going back to some of our original questions are, you know, what other host proteins are involved? And we, so we wanted to assess uh, the impact of cytoskeletal proteins on influenza viral RNA transport. And this has been done a little bit in the literature and people have used drugs to look at the role of microtubules and actin in during viral infection. Um, and, you know, there's some discrepancy about how large of an effect um, these different cytoskeletal proteins have on viral replication. And so we wanted to take a more... Um, mechanistic viewpoint on this and look in live cells as to what happens. So um, we wanted to define the cytoskeletal proteins um, that facilitate viral RNA transport, and we started with microtubules. And the reason for that is because RAB11A is thought to primarily move along microtubules in many cell types. Even though it can move along actin, um, it tends to prefer to move along microtubules, um, especially for its apical transport from the microtubule organizing center out. Um, and so if you treat cells, that these are our stable cell lines, either with DMSO or with nicotazole, which is a drug that will depolymerize microtubules, um, what you hopefully will notice is that the amount of micro, the microtubule localization is sort of disrupted. It's um, pushed to the periphery and it's no longer concentrated in, inside of the cell. It also changes the apical distribution. So this is a uh, sort of confocal slice. And so we started with nicotazole. And again, here I'll just show you some movies. So this is untreated cells. These are stable expressed cell lines. These are uninfected, um, and you see this nice dynamic movement. And now, if I if we treat these cells with nicotazole and do imaging, what you will hopefully notice a very stark difference in the movement. So this movie is actually playing, but the the RAB11A is not moving as dynamically as in untreated cells. And also, when we have uh, looked at the titers uh, or replication capacity of the 2009 pandemic H1N1 virus in cells treated with nicotazole, and we haven't seen a difference at multiple MOIs um, in MDCK cells or in A549 cells, it's showing you here that our drug treatment is working. Um, we've also done this in differentiated airway epithelial cells. So these are human bronchial epithelial cells that are grown at an air liquid interface on trans wells. And you can treat with nicotazole, which breaks down all the microtubules that are in the beautiful cilia of these cells. Um, and we see no difference in growth of, of the 2009 pandemic H1M1 virus in um, the system either. So this was really striking to us because clearly there is a large impact on the movement of RAB11A when we treat with nicotazole or drugs that depolymerize microtubules, but there doesn't seem to be any impact on viral uh, replication. 
Um, and so we wanted to visualize the dynamics of viral replication or, or viral transport um, in cells treated with nicotazole. And to that, for that, we turned to a virus that I developed uh, many years ago, which um, the PA protein, which again is one of the components of the polymerase complex that is bound by the three prime and five prime ends of the viral RNA, is bound to GFP. And these cells, so here is here are cells that have um, this PA GFP virus, so it can infect cells, it turns them green, um, and we can stain for the nuclear protein. Um, and we find that roughly about 85% of all of the foci uh, almost 90% in 8549 cells um, that are GFP positive, this PA GFP positive, also are NP positive, um, suggesting that it is a good surrogate for viral RNA uh, to study viral RNA dynamics in live cells. And so here um, are, again, two cells. So this is DMSO treated. So these are now 8549 cells that are infected with the 2009 pandemic uh, virus that it has a PA that is uh, fused to GFP, so full length GFP. Oops, uh, I want to play this movie. Yep. Okay, so if, if you treat with DMSO, so these are, um, you know, uh, normal cells. This is you're you're looking at viral RNA movement now uh, in the GFP. As you see, it's very dynamic. If you have these cells and you treat with nicotazole, you actually still see very dynamic movement of viral RNA segments. Um, and so there clearly is as you would expect from the viral titer data, that, that viral RNA are still being um, transported around the cell and packaged efficiently. If we look at the dynamics of the transport, we see that um, the movement of uh, the PAGFP vesicle um, foci within a cell, we see that the dynamics are very similar in the absence of microtubules. Um, and so there's no real change in track, in track displacement, a little bit uh, slower track speeds um, and a little bit um, less straight. Um, but there's no difference in the amount of times it arrests. Um, and this is in stark contrast when you look at the movement around 11A vesicles um, when you treat with nicotazole. And so we believe that there is a microtubule and RAB11A independent mechanism of transport. Um, this is also confirmed a little bit by looking at the co-localization of RAB11A. This is again stable cell lines expressing RAB11A GFP that we then infected with this WSN H1N1 strain. And we did, uh, this is immunofish, and so we stained for the viral RNA segment here of PA. Um, and you, we can then quantify and do um, fine co-localization on um, fine Z stacks. So we do co confocal imaging where we take fine Z stacks and then we can co-localize spots inside of, a, uh, inside of a cytoplasm um, to look at things that are related. And so if you have untreated or DMSO treated versus nicotazole treated, um, you see that the amount in the nicotazole treated group that are co-located RAB11 and GFP and uh, viral RNA go down. Um, and this is resulted by an increase in the amount of viral RNA um, uh, foci alone. So to summarize this part of my talk, um, I've hopefully uh, you uh, see the convincing data that influenza viral RNA segments alter the movement of RAB11A to become slower and less directed. Uh, RAB11A movement is microtubule dependent. However, um, intact microtubule filaments are not necessary for influenza viral replication or viral RNA transport. Um, and that there's only a slight difference um, when you depolarize the move, there's only a slight difference in the movement of viral RNA uh, when you depolarize microtubules. And so this um, sort of helps identify that viral infection alters the transport machinery associated with rab 11 a recycling endosomes, and that there are redundant mechanisms of transport, right? There clearly is a rab 11 a and microtubule independent mechanism of transport um, that we are actively going after. And so coming back now to our track, I'm going to switch directions and talk about the third hurdle and some work that my lab has been doing to sort of understand the viral um, properties that promote airborne transmission. And so how does flu transmit? Um, for those in the audience who don't think about transmission as much as I do, uh, you can break this down into three ways. So there is contact transmission. This can be direct or indirect. Um, so either direct is in the um, presence of a contaminated in the absence of a contaminated surface, so either kissing or shaking hands, um, and indirect involves a contaminated surface. The other is respiratory droplet transmission. Um, and so you can see, see in the sneeze diagram um, that there 
when you breathe out or when you sneeze, you dis, uh, expel a wide range of aerosols. And there are some fine aerosols and there are these larger droplets. And these larger droplets will fall out of the air. And so this is known as droplet spray transmission where these larger droplets can fall onto um, either people and the mucous membranes um, and cause uh, disease or aerosol transmission, which are these little fine mist aerosols that you can breathe into your lower lungs. Uh, and typically these, uh, these aerosols are um, less than five microns in size. And so we've been thinking about um, sort of how influenza transmission happens and some of the parameters that modulate influenza transmission uh, quite a bit since I was a postdoc with Kanta Subarao at the NIH. And so you can imagine that there are, you know, you can break transmission up into three different zones, right? There is the donor. Um, and so all of the things that are happening within that donor, the, repl the virus that's replicating within that donor, where it's replicating are all important for thinking about airborne transmission. Then there is the environment, because in order for transmission to actually function, these expelled viruses have to remain infectious in the environment for a considerable amount of time. Uh, and then there is the recipient and you know the immune status of that recipient. Are they susceptible? Are they um, resistant to infection? And these are all, you know, modulation of any of these three parameters could impact the transmissibility of influenza viruses. And so the story I'm gonna tell you about today is sort of looking at the role of environment because this is a critical aspect um, because you can imagine that we, by understanding how persistent um, and how the environment um, manipulates expelled influenza viruses and droplets, um, we can start to uh, think about non-pharmaceutical intervention strategies to limit the spread of influenza in, during seasonal infections or during a future pandemics. And so we started with the idea of relative humidity because that's been proposed in the literature quite a bit to impact uh, transmissibility of influenza viruses. And so the prevailing dogma, um, not just with, with viruses or influenza viruses, but even with bacteria and fungus is that microbes are less pathogenic um, at mid-range relative humidity conditions. And so this is sort of an old chart uh, and I just wanna break this down. So in the winter time, if you are in a temperate region and you, uh, it's cold like in Pittsburgh and you have the heat on, um, you're somewhere within this 20 to 30% relative humidity range because the heater is drying out the air. In the summertime, you tend to have uh, the AC on and so you have, um, you know, the humidity is a little bit wetter and it's about 40 to 50%. And so this mid range is thought to be this optim optimal environment in which we can live in. So we wanted to ask a very simple question, um, whether relative humidity impacts the viability of, hu of seasonal influenza viruses, human seasonal influenza viruses. And we did this in collaboration with Lindsay Mart, Virginia Tech, who is an aerobiologist and has published uh, a couple of papers on this topic um, over, the, over a number of years. And this work was done by Karen Cormuth in my lab, a postdoctoral fellow. And so working with engineers are really fun because they can build all sorts of neat things to test uh, hypotheses. And so we went back to some old uh, information on uh, rotating drum vessels. And so Lindsay and her team constructed a rotating drum with tunable relative humidity. So we have this drum, it's uh, in a biosafety cabinet in my lab uh, on occasion, and we can first condition the drum to different humidity conditions. And we can, uh, with dry air and wet air, and then we can let, uh, we can nebulize virus uh, into the drum after it's been conditioned. And at the end of the drum on the other side, there is an environmental uh, port, so we can monitor the humidity and temperature. And then we can close off the drum and we can rotate it. And I'll show you this little movie here of it rotating. And then we can open up the port on the back and then collect uh, aged aerosols after one hour in these different humidity conditions. And this nebulizer will make very small submicron aerosols. So in order to study this, right, this is, this, you know, this question has been asked in the past and most people have used either lab adapted strains of influenza viruses or they've grown viruses in MTCK cells um, or in eggs. And those don't really mimic the physiological droplets that we breathe out or sneeze out as, a, as humans. Uh, because we have a lot of mucus in our airways. And um, so in order to recapitulate this, we actually use um, 
differentiated airway epithelial cells. So these are human bronchial epithelial cells. Um, these are grown in a three-dimensional culture. So they're on a transwell. They are differentiated at an air-liquid interface. Um, and they form mucus because they're at this air-liquid interface. They form a lot of really interesting mucus um, that we can collect and we call this airway surface liquid. And we can combine this airway surface liquid with viruses that we have grown in um, MDCK cells, a very traditional tissue culture method. Um, and then we can nebulize this mixture into the rotating drum and we can ask questions about how relative humidity will impact the stability of the 2009 pandemic H1N1 virus in aerosols at different humidity conditions. And we did a range of humidity conditions and I think you will notice from this graph that there was no difference. So I'm just showing you here, these first few bars are indoor heating and these are um, sort of the what we would consider the optimal indoor AC conditions. Um, and so this was very striking to us in that we didn't see any decay of influenza viruses after an hour at these different relative humidity conditions in, in suspended aerosols. Um, we also used Phi-6, which is a surrogate that can be done down at Virginia Tech to test whether this airway surface liquid is really the one that was protecting it. So Phi-6 is also an enveloped bacteriophage. Um, and you'll see that if you uh, supplement Phi-6 media with uh, airway surface liquid from human bronchial epithelial cells, you see uh, no decay. And when you uh, have just media without any of the airway surface liquid, you do have decay at this mid-range relative humidity condition, which would um, suggest that the virus is less stable. And we also needed to show that the nebulization didn't impact the virus um, suspension. And so we did uh, studies looking at the titer pre and post aerosolization of the nebulized material, and we didn't see any differences in titer. So nebulization didn't have an impact. So this is really interesting because in aerosols, it suggests that um, viruses that are released into these small aerosols are highly persistent uh, in our environment. Um, and we wanted to correlate this with droplets because again, fomites and large droplets that fall out of the air can also uh, facilitate the spread of influenza viruses uh, in the community. And so we used a chamber system where we can um, manipulate the relative humidity within a chamber by different, uh, by having uh, different saturated salts within that chamber. So it's just a desiccated chamber. We have a relative humidity and temperature logger that is constantly monitoring the temperature and humidity within this chamber. And we can make small one microliter droplets uh, onto uh, just a tissue culture plastic dish and do it in three replicates to see whether in droplets um, humidity has an impact on the stability. And so if we just take MDCK grown to the um, viruses, again, this is the 2009 pandemic H1N1 virus, um, you see that there is a loss in titer. Um, again, this is raw uh, titers here at mid-range humidity conditions. And um, I'm probably going to show most uh, often now log decay, which uh, is virus viability goes down or titer goes down, log decay goes up. And so if you see this same data uh, plotted as log decay, you see this um, sort of V-shaped curve. And this is what has been published uh, in the literature and found by previous groups. Uh, we then wanted to ask whether the airway surface liquid could protect viruses from decay, similar to that we saw in aerosols. And so we removed airway surface liquid from uninfected uh, human bronchial epithelial cells at this three-dimensional airway cultures and combined it with MDCK uh, grown virus. And we did the same sort of droplets at a range of different humidity conditions. And what you can see is in black are the droplets um, where you are incubating the viruses with the airway surface liquid from epithelial cells. And in red are the MDCK grown virus that I just showed you before. And clearly there is less decay. So again, this is log decay um, in droplets that contain human airway mucus, suggesting that airway mucus can provide some sort of microenvironment that protects the virus from decay in these environmental conditions. But these are all supplemented with mucus. And so we wanted to ask whether the lung environment can change the relationship uh, between viruses and, and humidity. And so now we grew viruses in uh, HBE cultures. And so viruses, especially human seasonal viruses grow quite well in these uh, cell culture models. And they will, when the 
uh, the virus that we collect from them will already be coated in this mucus environment and these airway, uh, the proteins that are sort of expelled from airway epithelial cells. And we did similar experiments where we looked at uh, the stability of viruses in droplets um, at different humidity conditions when they were grown in these HB cells. And so here I'm just showing you the raw titers. So there'll be two graphs of raw titers, and then I'll show you the log decay. Um, and as we've done this over and over again, what we've noticed is that when we believe that viruses are sensitive to different humidity conditions, um, that, that sensitivity, we're sort of marking a benchmark of two logs decay. So here, and these MDCK grown at two nine, uh, the 2009 pandemic grown in MDCK cells, uh, at 75% and 85%, there's two logs less uh, in these compared to a node chamber control uh, and compared to low uh, relative humidity conditions. If we take virus of a 2009 pandemic that's been grown in these HBE cells, we no longer see this decay uh, at these humidity conditions, and that can and that you can see here at um, in the log decay format. So in seasonal, so we did a seasonal H3 antivirus is actually quite interesting. We we did uh, we see some decay, but not this too long decay uh, in in the 2000 in. Uh, H3N2 virus uh, from 2009, this Perth H3N2, um, but if you grow them in HB cells, you no longer see any decay. Again, they're highly stable, they seem to be, um, in droplets at a range of rel uh, relative humidity conditions. And then when we looked at flu B, it was quite interesting, and that flu B sort of was different, and that we did again see this uh, greater than twofold log decay uh, at in MDCK-grown uh, B viruses, so for those who, who may not no, uh, during an influenza season, um, not only is there influenza A circulating, but also there's influenza B circulating. And then uh, we also see this um, decay greater than two logs in viruses, uh, influenza B viruses that are grown in HBE cells, suggesting that influenza B viruses perhaps are not protected by an interaction with the airway surface liquid, and that there may be um, components or virus specific factors that are promoting um, this type of uh, protection. And so I'm going to end with a model. Um, and what we think is happening here is sort of like trying to, you know, bring all this data together. And we have some other ones, some other data as well, um, how this sort of, you know, impacts transmissibility. Because we do know uh, from epidemiology data um, as well as uh, animal model data that at um, mid range relative humidity conditions, there is a decrease in transmission. And so what we think is happening is that perhaps it's more about the physics of the droplet. So at low relative humidity conditions, um, the virus is sort of remains in these smaller droplets for longer and can facilitate more long range uh, transmission. Whereas higher droplets, uh, at higher RH, the droplets are able to take on more water and fall out of the air at a faster rate. Um, and we know that sometimes contact, direct, uh, indirect contact as well as fomite transmission are less efficient um, at long range transmission um, than aerosol transmission. So we think primarily during a season, um, aerosol transmission will drive transmissibility in, in some context. Um, and so just to sort of sum up, um, my lab at the University of Pittsburgh has sort of two areas that we are focused in. We're looking at the role of uh, influenza virus assembly and reassortment, as well as properties that promote airborne transmission of influenza viruses. And our ultimate goal is that we can combine these two areas to get um, a better assessment of the pandemic potential of circulating zoonotic viruses, uh, and really to help um, you know, have a way of screening emerging pandemic threats uh, in a more sophisticated manner. Um, and so this, I'll just acknowledge this is my lab. Uh, I've tried to highlight everyone, um, everyone's work. Um, this is our funding sources. Uh, again, Ummer uh, developed the, uh, the light sheet microscope and, and constructed it here at our lab uh, in collaboration with Hari Schroff. Um, Mike Meyerberg and the folks at the University of Pittsburgh Airway Tissue Corps have been fantastic in uh, getting us uh, airway. Uh, these human airway epithelial cells. Um, also, we have a great collaboration with Lindsay Mart at Virginia Tech to study the uh, persistence and longevity of influenza viruses and aerosols and droplets, and that work was done by Karen. Um, if you want to see our movies and some of the things that we're working on, uh, we always try to post new movies from our Dice Bim at our website. 
walktowellab.com. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, all of the code that we've generated um, to analyze the tracks of um, viral RNA as well as RAB11A in three dimensions is available on our GitHub site. Um, these are, again, our funding sources. And I want to just highlight uh, this past year, um, myself and Ed Hutchinson sort of published a, a series of educational material, influenza viruses. Um, so Ed made this very beautiful coloring page uh, and I made a connect the dots to sort of highlight the new architecture of the influenza genome and we have a world word find. Um, so if you know any teachers or you teach undergrads or high school students uh, and you want to explain influenza to them, we have a couple of materials that can be used. This is open source and so it should be freely available to everybody. And there's also a fact page um, that we made. Um, so I would love for people to use it. Um, and with that, I will take your questions. Yes, thank you, Seema. That was so interesting. I loved your pictures and videos. Um, at this point, we can't take any questions. Just type them into your question box and I will read them. And while we're waiting for others to kind of get their stuff typed in, I'm curious if you could give us a little bit of information on the RAB11 independent pathway that you talked about in your first section. You said you guys are chasing that down and I'm interested what you found so far. Yeah, actually, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there was a really nice paper from Not in a Fox group um, where they have shown um, that the endoplasmic reticulum, um, and I think it's using RAB11A, but that, the, that viral RNA can actually also transport along um, the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, right? So if you imagine, there's a lot of membrane inside of a cell, right? So there are these endosomes, there's the ER, there's the Golgi. Um, and so it sort of is sparking this uh, this thing that we're thinking about and that perhaps the viral RNA just want a membranous scaffold. And the ER is quite interesting uh, because using lattice light sheet microscopy, uh, folks in Eric, Betzig, Eric Betzig's group has shown that uh, the ER can actually expand large spaces within the cytoplasm very rapidly. Um, and they don't need microtubules or cytoskeletal proteins to do this. How that sort of like forming its tubular sheets and like sort of branching off and anchoring points is sort of an interesting uh, biophysical property of the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and so right now what we're doing is developing uh, pipelines to visualize the endoplasmic reticulum on our dice bin, um, similar to the work that's been done by Eric Betzig and his group. Um, and then combining that with our fluorescent viruses to see is the viral RNA on these endoplasmic reticulums, is RAB11A there in the absence of RAB11A, is that what it's being uh, transported along? Um, and so that's what we're chasing right now. We do um, think that they're membranous vesicles, um, but yeah. Got it, awesome, thanks. Um, and we do have another question. I think it says, um, what do you think makes H1N1 different to single it out for the protective effect by the lung mucus microenvironment? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So this has been a really fun experiment. And one some slides I took out is that we've also started to look at the longevity of the response. And we see that there is um, subtype dependent uh, longevity. So H1N1 viruses tend to behave a specific, a uh, different way um, and how long they're persistent in droplets um, than H3N2 viruses as well as influenza B viruses. Um, and what we think is happening is we think that there are specific viral properties and we're very interested in the HA protein. Um, so we've done some initial mass spec analysis of our airway surface liquid and we find that there is a lot of, of course, as you would expect, sialic acid and proteins that are heavily glycosylated there, um, as well as mucin, which is heavily glycosylated and uh, influenza HA binds to sialic acid receptors. Um, and, you know, H1 and H3 would have similar um, sialic acid preferences, but the avidity of which they bind um, may be slightly different. And so we're looking at how the um, HANA balance of H1 versus H3 is help facilitating their stability within these droplets and how that could also be responsible for this transmission uh, properties that we see. It is quite interesting in animal models, we have some data suggesting that the H1N1 pandemic virus is heavily transmissible, right? So that virus will transmit um, very efficiently even within very short period of time um, that's been shown by other groups as well as us, that within two days you'll get 100% transmission of the 2009 pandemic H1N1 virus. And that's not true um, with H seasonal H3N2 viruses. And so understanding how sensitive uh, these viruses are and the differentiation between these viruses and their sensitivity in the environmental conditions, it might be really important for teasing apart these differences that we see in the transmission. Got it. 
Um, it looks like there are no other questions. So Seema, I want to thank you again for a wonderful talk and thank you to everybody who joined. And this will be available on the Human Vaccines Project website later today if you want to watch. So thank you. Thank you all so much.